Morning. Morning. Happy Father's Day to you dads out there and uh, all your children out there. Make sure you say Happy Father's Day and give your dad a hug if, if you can. So it was very hard to get one from my son this morning <laughs> as we were back there in the corner and he wouldn't hug me, but it's okay. Uh, anyways, um, uh, joy and honor to preach the Word of God once again. Um, you know, the last couple of weeks we've been talking about what is discipleship, kind of giving you an overview of what our church is all about and uh, what we really believe in and kind of like our core values. And um, we're going to kind of take like a three-week break here, study the book of James together, kind of break away from that, and then start a new sermon series um, in the month of July. And so uh, with that, let me pray for us, and then let's, let's get right into the Word. Let's, let's pray together. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you welcome us into your presence today. And we thank you that as we gather and as we open up our hearts and open up our mouths to you, to bless you and to praise you, we thank you that you are so gracious to open up the heavens as we open up your word to fill us now, as we open up our mouths, that you would fill our minds and you would fill our hearts with more of you. Because God, we know that in this world, we know that in our own hearts and in ourselves, God, there is no good. Uh, but as we're reminded, as we're seeing good, good um, the goodness of God. We're reminded that you are a good father who loves us perfectly, who knows exactly what we need. And I do pray that your word would speak to us in a timely manner, convict us in the ways your spirit wants to convict and transform us. And so we thank you for your word. We thank you that you, what you want to teach us through the book of James, especially as we talk about taming the tongue. So Lord, lead us into your word. May your word speak. May I not speak, but may your word speak. May your spirit speak to us directly today. So thank you for this time. We commit it to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. As a child, as an adolescent, I remember saying this to myself. As I was called derogatory knaves for having, having smaller eyes, being the shortest among my peers, and having a home that smelled like kimchi and pan-fried fish. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And so I would repeat this phrase to myself. And now as an adult, I realize that these words are a complete lie. And perhaps these are words that you've repeated to yourself to justify and to fend off these feelings of being marginalized. And in a day and age of social media, where everyone is entitled to their own opinions about politics, about race, about food, about the best vacation destinations, we can be tempted to think that, you know what, airing our opinions is not all that harmful. Unfortunately, instead of engaging in dialogue, especially on social media, seeking understanding, extending grace, we seek to be right. We seek for our rights, and we seek for victory. And so our words are used as a weapon to hurt instead of to help. And so do the words that you use hurt and tear people down? Or do the words that you use heal and build people up? And that's the same question that James is asking as we look at James chapter 3 today. Because our spiritual maturity can actually be measured by the way we use our words. Right, if we can sum up the first two chapters of James, James is challenging us. Guard yourselves from being double-minded, unstable, and persevere in your faith. And that growing in your faith, you know what's going to happen? You'll be able to love your neighbor. You'll be able to love one another in the church. And we know James is more interested in us doing faith. Instead of just understanding what the scriptures say, he says that what? Faith without deeds is dead. Right? He's calling us to be obedient without compromise to the word of God, which brings us to today's text, James chapter 3, starting at verse 1. That's what it says. It says that James says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways, and anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. But when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder where the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. 
Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. And you're like, James, that doesn't sound all that encouraging. And he goes on, but as he goes on, it says, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by, man, by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. He keeps, keeps giving us bad news. And then verse 9, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. And out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Of course not. My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Of course not. Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. See, I think without a doubt here, James warns us of the potentially destructive nature and the power of our words. And apparently there were, I'm sure, verbal and physical fights in the early church destroying God's community. And as the believers were scattered throughout the Roman Empire, he warns them about their need. You have to take control of your words because that is how a maturing believer has power in their lives. And so this morning, I want to answer three questions that will help us tame our tongue. Okay, three questions that will help us tame our tongue. First question we'll answer is this. What does James teach us about the tongue? Okay, Because with our tongue, James tells us, we can praise God. We can pray. We can preach. We can share the gospel. But it is with that same tongue, we can lie. We can ruin a person's reputation or break someone's heart. Right? And it goes without saying, and I think we all know, the tongue is powerful and difficult to control. And so what does James teach us about the tongue? First thing he teaches us is the tongue is powerful. Tongue is powerful. Uh, a few years ago, <coughs> excuse me, I got a ticket in the mail uh, for crossing a railroad track while the gates were coming down. There were actually several cameras at this crossing. And I get the ticket in the mail, and there's the picture of my Camry, there's a picture of my license plate, and there's a picture of my face <laughs> on the ticket. No doubt it was me. And this ticket actually required me to go into court. So I showed up at court. There were probably about 100 other people there, all for the same ticket. And one by one, as they got called up, they went up, and they declared themselves, are you guilty or you're not guilty before the judge? And if you pled not guilty, judge actually asked you, can you go sit down and wait till the end of the session? And so I actually went up and I said, I'm not guilty. And then when, I, when he called me back up again at the end, judge asked me, hey, why do you think you're not guilty? And I went on to explain. I'm like, no, the, the, the gate wasn't coming down. I was already, you know, crossing the track. And I was explaining myself and he said, well, you're still guilty. <laughs> you're still guilty. That's why you're here. That's why you got the ticket in the mail. But instead of paying $200, I actually just needed to pay $100. And I was so happy. Right, I was guilty, but I only had to pay half. See, there's power, right? There's power when a judge declares you what? Not guilty, right? In my, in my case, it was guilty, but pay less money. Or there's a different kind of power when a judge declares you what? Guilty. Because both statements have power, but with completely different ramifications and consequences, right? One leads to freedom. One leads to condemnation. Right, look at what verse 1 says. It says, Not many of you should become teachers, James says, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. See, many in his time, James's time, were seeking to become teachers because teachers in the early Jewish Christian church would have had a place of prestige and honor in a place in society where no one, where it was very difficult for people to socially advance. Right? You wanted to be, have a seat of influence. You wanted to have a voice you wanted a place at the table. And while it seems that James is actually specifically speaking to teachers here, he's actually speaking to the entire church. And he's actually saying, it doesn't matter if you're a teacher, it doesn't matter if you're a leader or a layperson, your words have power, right? Because look, look what James says in verse 2. He says, we all stumble in many ways. He says, we all, it doesn't matter who you are, regardless of who you are, you stumble, you sin. Because anyone who is never at fault in what they say, is perfect, able to keep their whole body 
in check. To keep in check here means to bridle, right? It's like the harness over the horse's head. You take control of the body by restraining your tongue. And James knows here in verse 2, that's why he says it. He's like, you can't do it. You're not perfect. You're not, no one is able to do it. And so then you're left wondering, how is it that this piece of flesh in our mouths, so small compared to the rest of our bodies, is so powerful, so influential, and so difficult to control? Right, but just as a small bit is used to control horse, just as the little rudder that steers the large ship, just as the tiny spark that sets an entire forest on fire, the tongue is small, but it's very, very powerful. Right, look at verse 3. Because when we put bits into the mouths of horses, what, what does it do? It makes them obey us, right? So that we can turn the whole animal. We can direct the animal where we want it to go. And just as the bit determines the direction of the horse, your words, whether they be positive or negative, they impact the body of Christ. They impact the people around you. And so James goes on in verse 4. He's like, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, right, they're taken on by hard, rough, violent winds. They're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. It has the potential and the capability to be so arrogant. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark, he says. See, James here in describing a great force that is set on fire by a small spark, he's expressing how easily and how disastrous a fire can spread. Not just in one direction, but in many directions, right? Because we know a fire moves with force. It does not care who or what gets in its way. Right? We know the destruction of fire is rampant. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that the tongue is small because our words come out with power. Uh, last August, Linda and I, we were in L.A., and we witnessed this um, wildfire in the San Gabriel Mountains. And uh, I don't know why we were driving towards it, but uh, we were trying to get out of town. We are driving towards it. But if you've, we, here in the Midwest, we see it on TV all the time. But this is the first time I saw one, like, live. And it is spectacular. It is amazing. And all I was asking as we were driving closer and closer to it, man, it's just too hot outside. It's too dry. How in the world are they going to put this fire out? Because, you know, we know once it starts, it takes so much time, so many resources, around-the-clock effort to stop the fire. So Proverbs 16, 27 reminds us, a scoundrel plots evil and on their lips, it is like what? A scorching fire, right? Because our words are powerful like a fire, they can be destructive. Look at what James says in verse 6. He says, the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. You know, simply put, James is saying that the tongue is fallen. Tongue is full of sin. The tongue stains the entire body, setting our entire body on fire. In other words, the tongue, by being one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult parts of the body to control, it becomes the vehicle by which evil actually expresses itself through us. And so James makes clear, yes, the tongue is small, but it has influence. It has power. Okay? So what does James teach us about the tongue? It's powerful. And he teaches us another thing. He says the tongue is difficult to control. You know, even, um, even when I don't think I'm yelling or raising my voice, you know my kids tell me that I'm yelling and I'm raising my voice. I tell them, no, I'm not. And they tell me, yes, you are. I'm like, no, I'm not. They're like, yes, you are. Because even for me and for any of us, we might have the best intentions, but sometimes the words, they actually still don't come out of the mouth right. right? The tongue is very difficult to control. Even John Calvin says this. He says, a slender portion of flesh contains the whole world of iniquity. Right? Calvin's saying that the tongue contains a world of sin. And even in addressing the Pharisees and speaking to the crowds, we look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 7, about the difficulty of controlling the tongue. Who says this? You hypocrites! 
Jesus says. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And then he goes on in verse 10 and says, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. But look at what he says. He says, no, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Tongue is very difficult to control because no other part of the body wreaks so much havoc and destruction. So difficult to control the tongue, James compares it to what? Taming animals, right? Verse 7. He says, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. And here, James, using the imagery of taming animals, James is speaking about how man, you and I, we've been created in the image of God and how we have a God-given responsibility to bring creation under control, under our rule, to tame creation. And though our tongues are restless and difficult to control, like wild, dangerous animals that seek to prey, pounce, and kill, there's a divine mandate on our lives. There's a divine calling on us to subdue and to take control of our words. And though we have this divine call, James tells us that no one can tame the tongue, right? Verse 8, he says, no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Tongue is restless. It's the same idea found earlier in James chapter 1 when he talks about instability and double-mindedness. The tongue is unstable. It's always able to just break out, even when you don't want it to, because it's difficult to control. I mean, so then you're like, well, does it mean we shouldn't even try? No, of course not, because look what James says in verse 9. He says, with the tongue, what do we do? We praise, we bless our Lord and Father. And yet this is, the, this is the dilemma. With the same mouth, the same tongue, we curse, we injure, we harm human beings who have been made in what? God's likeness, in the image of God. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. And what does James say? My brothers and sisters, this should not be. And this is James's concern for the believers. You're double-minded. You are unstable. You're inconsistent. You can't please both God. You can't please the world at the same time. How can a follower of Jesus denigrate and destroy the community of God and at the same time blessing and curses come from those same lips? Right? We come together like this to worship. We unite our hearts. We, we unite our voices. And if this is our greatest testimony to the watching world, what will the world see if we are like the world? when we are cursing and hurting one another. Verse 10, my brothers and sisters, James says, this should not be. Right, James is saying, it's not necessary that these things should happen this way. Right, so instead of trying to be right all the time, instead of trying to get your way all the time, or having to prove someone wrong, while, yes, it is difficult to control the tongue, you have to seek to extend grace to one another. Because even if everything else about us is different, our interests, our looks, our clothing, one thing is the same. It's Jesus. We're only here because of Jesus. Jesus alone is the one that unites us and brings us together. And that's James's argument here. Right? Each of us are a beloved child of God. Each of us have been created in God's image. And it's not our responsibility to take God's place. Right? We are God's children, and that's what matters the most. And so what does James teach us about the tongue? My tongue is powerful. And we know that the tongue is difficult to control, which leads us to the second question. Why must we tame the tongue? Why must we tame the tongue? Well, because our words reveal the condition of our hearts, and we're accountable for our words. I was like on Twitter this week, just kind of looking for some things. This is, what, this is some things I found. If I can smell your breath through your mask... You need to go to the hospital. (laughs) So mean. Before I was married, I had no idea that I was always right, one woman said. And then Ricky Gervais said this. He said, praying is hilarious. Surely he knows, he's talking about God, knows what you want already. I just want to hear you say it. Beg, that's better. And I'll think about it. Ricky Gervais kind of playing God. You know, and so many speak so boldly, so courageously on Twitter, but then they hide and they cower behind their tweets. 
Because you know what? It's much easier to be careless, to be hurtful, to be hateful. Because you know what? There's no consequences to what is said, right? Because it's a free-for-all on Twitter. And so we're asking, why must we tame the tongue? Well, we have to tame the tongue because our words reveal the condition of our hearts. See, our words have this incredible ability to expose what's really happening inside of us. And so Jesus, in continuing to speak to the Pharisees and crowds, he goes on and says this in Matthew chapter 15, verse 18. He says, but the things that come out of a person's mouth, they're not really coming out of the mouth, they're coming from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come what? Evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. And so yes, words are powerful. They impact others. And when not under control, they have the power to destroy and to discourage. But if under control, our words have an incredible ability to empower and to encourage. And James makes clear that our words are a true indicator of what are, what's happening inside of us, our true spiritual condition. Look what he says in verse 5. He says, likewise, a tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes what? Great boasts. It's arrogant. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire. What does he say? A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. You know, I read this part, and I was like, come on, James. Why are you exaggerating? Why are you making such a big fuss over this small body part? Can the tongue really do that much damage? And I think all of us in our experience can say, yes, it can. Yes, it has. And yes, it will. Yes, it is a small part of the body. But the potential that it has to what? What does he say? Great boast, right? To be full of yourself. To be arrogant. Tongue represents what? A world of evil filled with corruption. See, because that's what happens when the tongue is not restrained. The rest of the body is uncontrolled and undisciplined. And so again, what is happening internally is externally revealed by what comes out of our mouths. See, this is why when you visit someone's house, by looking around, you know the things that they value, right? If it's clean or messy, by the decor, by the furniture arrangement. Now, if you come to our house, first thing you see when you come into our house is the TV. That's the first thing you see. Everything we do in the living room centers around this TV. We even cover the fireplace. We don't even care. But what you see externally is a manifestation of what's happening internally, right? And so just as it takes a tremendous amount of power, determination, and courage to control a wild horse, to steer a ship in the midst of whipping and driving winds, to refrain from throwing that lit match onto the dry brush and wood, James warns us here that if the tongue is not brought under control, it's an instrument that is set on fire by hell. It's where we give power to Satan. It's where the power of Satan gives the tongue its potential to destroy. And if we're not careful, our words can actually be satanic. Our words can be demonic. And it leads to a place of condemnation. Right? So Proverbs 10.8 says, The wise of heart will receive commandments, right? God's commands. But a babbling fool will come to ruin. Right, Proverbs 12, 19 says, truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue, it lasts only a moment. And so whether it be gossip or lying or boasting about things, it brings about an enormous and sometimes irreversible destruction, which exposes what's happening inside of us. I mean, we can even ask, like, what was in the heart of Jesus when he spoke, when he used his words? And do you remember the time when Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well? You know, he was filled with compassion because he knew that she needed not just water from the well, but the true and living water. Look at their interactions. This is John chapter 4, verse 25. Woman said, I know that Messiah, as they're interacting, called Christ. I know that he's coming. And when he comes, this Christ will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared with his own words, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. And you know, in response, this woman could not keep silent and spoke up of what Jesus did for her. John chapter 4, verse 39. It says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony, because of her words. 
He told me everything I ever did. And so when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. In verse 41, and because of his words, of Jesus' words, many more became believers. Right? Jesus' words demonstrated his compassion. The Samaritan's woman's words demonstrated what? Thankfulness. Right? Because words reveal condition of your heart. Okay? So why must we tame our tongue? Because our words reveal condition of our hearts. And then second reason why we must tame our tongue, because we're accountable for our words. Okay? We're accountable for our words. Um, they say the average person utters between 10,000 and 20,000 words per day. I'm probably on the lower end. Actually, I might not even make it to 10,000, <laughs> which I know frustrates like my kids and my wife and many that work with me. Um, well, I have to say, and Ethan, you can't tell Jaden this, I think Jaden is probably on the higher end of the 20,000. Okay? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, he said for sure. Because what happens is I'm going to bed at night, and I, all I hear is Jaden's voice as I fall asleep. <laughs> I still hear her talking. Now, if the average person speaks between 10,000 and 20,000 words each day, then we're looking at 10,000 to 20,000 opportunities to either build someone up or to bring someone down. We're accountable for our words. And whether to God or to the world or to one another, we'll be judged for our words. And we have a responsibility, a calling to protect God's name and to protect his church. Look at verse 1. It says, Not many of you should become teachers, James says, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be what? They're going to be judged. You'll be judged more strictly. And remember, James is not just speaking to teachers or leaders. He's speaking to the entire church. Because all of us here, we are all ministers of the gospel. And yes, because our ministry involves words, the hardest part of the body to control, we expose ourselves to greater judgment. Right? We know 1 Peter 4.17 reminds that judgment begins in the house of God. And we're seeing it all around us today. In many of the ministries we used to model, in many of the ministries we used to follow. And we have to remember, it's all coming out because one way or another, we are all accountable. It will all come out. The things we teach, the things we say, the things we believe, the things we hope in. Because nothing, nothing is hidden from God. And so one of the best things we can do for ourselves, knowing that we can't hide, is let's just admit that we sin. Let's just admit that we stumble and that we don't have goodness in us. Because look what it says in verse 2. James is so clear. He's like, we all stumble in many ways. He's just making a statement. We all sin in many ways. Because anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. To stumble here means you're caught in ruin. You're defeated. You make mistakes. You sin. Because haven't you noticed that when we try to take control, try to bring order to our relationships, we still continue to make mistakes. We still continue to kind of babble on, trying to like make sense of things, and we just find it really hard to fix things, right? To fix things. We continue to hide our sin, and then we get ourselves tangled up in a greater mess, right? In a bigger mess. And so just admit, it's okay. Just, I can't do it. Because our call is clear. From our tongue, we are to praise God. From our tongue, we are to bless God's people, right? Look at verse 10. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Right? Out of the same mouth should, should only come one thing, praise. My brothers and sisters, if it's cursing, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? No, of course not. My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives, a grapevine bear figs? Of course not. Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. I mean, James is pointing out here for us very clearly how absurd it is for blessings and curses to come from our lips. How absurd it is for fresh water to flow from a salt water spring or for a fig tree to produce olives or for a grapevine to produce figs. I mean, what's James's point? You have to speak like a freshwater spring that's useful for growing crops producing drinking water. Because salt water, we know, is bitter and it's useless. Right? It's impossible. I don't know how you, a fig tree can produce olives. I don't think it can. It's impossible for a grapevine to produce figs. 
In other words, source of blessings and praises cannot produce false, bitter, and harmful words. It's one or the other, and there is no in between, right? Bad things don't produce good things. What goes in, it comes out. You reap what you sow, and so we are accountable for our words. You know, and so when people say, like, I don't know why I said that. It's not really inside of me. And we've seen it, and maybe we've said it. People tweet a reactionary thought to something happened in the world, and then they delete it, right, because there's, like, backlash. But then it's not really deleted, right, because someone already, like, took a screenshot of it or someone already retweeted it. And then comes the apology tweet, right, explaining, oh, that's not what I really meant, And if that's not enough, they completely deactivate and shut down the account. Okay, So whether it's tweeting, texting, or our tongue, it has to be in you. It has to be in you, or else it wouldn't come out of you. So we're asking, why must we tame our tongue? Because our words reveal the condition of our hearts, and we're accountable for our words. Which leads us to the last question. How then do we tame our tongue? How do we tame our tongue? Because, of course, we know that the problem is not really our tongue, right? It's an issue of the heart, right? And so this is a week of repentance for me, personally, as I'm talking about taming the tongue. I confessed my sins to my accountability group on Tuesday. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Judgmental thoughts and words I had towards people. Thank you, guys. Regretful ways in which I confronted and raised my voice, even, toward my children, Because, you know, I have this tendency to jump to conclusions, to read into things. I have this tendency to speak to my kids without understanding where they are really coming from. And so we're asking, how do we tame our tongue? I think there's two ways. First way is this. You need to be quick to listen. Quick to listen. You know, we all know those people who always have something to say about everything. Whether it's their thoughts or their opinions, they just can't, like, wrangle in their words. Right? They're quick to speak, slow to listen. Right. And it's a silly example, but the other day, like, Phil called me, called me up, he had a question, and actually he asked me the question, and I didn't have an immediate answer or response to his question, and I told him, you know what, let me think about it, and I'll get back to you. And to him, he probably thought, why don't you have an answer? Isn't it a reasonable request, a reasonable question? And yes, when I look back on it now, it was a reasonable request, it was a reasonable question. But I just wanted to make sure that I correctly understood his question before I gave a response. Right? Be quick to listen. Because once I say it, I cannot take it back. Right? Be quick to listen. And we can learn a valuable lesson from James. Because look, again, what he says in verse 2. We have to be quick to listen because if we are not, we know. We are, we are prone to stumble in many ways. Right? Verse 2. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault on what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. And here James, he knows. No one is perfect. We know. We stumble and we sin. But we know once you open your mouth, your entire life can be destroyed by what you say. And sometimes relationships, they're irreconcilable because you did not take the time to listen. Right? Instead, you had to be right. Instead, you had to get your way. And like a wildfire, time doesn't necessarily correct your sins. Sometimes a fire actually keeps spreading well after it's come out of your mouth. Right? That's what Proverbs 10.19 says. When words are many, transgression is not lacking. Sin is not lacking. But whoever retains his lips is prudent, right? Is wise. Guys, the more we talk, the more we are prone in giving ourselves the opportunity to sin. Our words have that much power, that much power to destroy. And so listen before you speak, because our words have the power not just to destroy, but also has the power to build someone up. Because again, when we look at Jesus, even in his interaction with the woman at the well, for some reason, Jesus, well, he is God, right? But he had the right words at the right time. And none of his words were wasted. Jesus met her where she was at and didn't want this woman to stay thirsty any longer, spiritually thirsty any longer. And so he was effectively able to encourage her, to build her up and to empower this woman because he was willing to engage and listen to her at the well. Right, James 1.26 says this, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rate on their tongues, rain on their tongues, deceive themselves in their religion 
is worthless, right? Tongue reveals what's inside of our hearts. James 2.12 says this, speak and act as those who are going to be judged. Again, this idea of being accountable for our words. By the law, that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And we see very quickly here that the idea of being quick to listen is also linked very closely to the second way we tame our tongue, by doing what? By being slow to speak. Right? Be slow, I'll be quick to listen, slow to speak. Right? They go hand in hand. Because listening, what does it do? It tends to be others-centered, while our talking tends to be me-centered. Right? No other part of the body can bring so much destruction, but at the same time, bring so much encouragement and hope. Right? So I said, James 1.19 says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should, what? Be quick to listen, slow to speak, right? slow to become angry. And so after about five minutes, I gave Phil an answer to his question. I texted him back. But I know that in those five minutes, I think Phil had a lot of different thoughts in his, heads, in his head um, because he's like, can we have a follow-up conversation to our conversation? Um, and then because he, I think there was some misunderstanding. And I told him, I'd rather err on the side of caution than, I, I sound so mad. That's not, I wasn't yelling at him. <laughs> I'd rather err on the side of caution than respond immediately with an incorrect answer. It's very simple. I'm not all that loaded, okay? What you see is what you get. Because, again, once we say something, we can't take it back, and it's out there, okay? So be slow to speak, because why? Verse 9, with the tongue, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to praise our Lord and Father. And for some reason, we still curse human beings who've been made in God's image, in his likeness. Right? Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing, James says, my brothers and sisters. He's like imploring us, pleading with us, this should not be. Right? So guard yourself from being what? Unstable and double-minded. And this is on you. It's on you. And I know I'm sure words have hurt you, hurt, words have offended you, but this is on you, not on anyone else. You are accountable for what comes out of your heart. They are accountable for what comes out of their heart. And so make your 10,000, 20,000 words per day count. Right? Proverbs 18.6 says, A fool's lips walk into a fight, and his mouth invites a beating. A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are a snare to his soul. Make your words count. Because you see, when the wild horse can be contained, it can be used to work instead of destroy. When the ship can be steered, you can take it where you want it to go, and it doesn't get shipwrecked somewhere. When the fire can be controlled, it can be used purposefully, right, to cook, to keep warm, to generate power. You know, I don't know why some of us feel that opening our mouths helps when it would actually be more beneficial to keep our mouths closed. Right, because a person who makes an unguarded statement can suddenly find themselves in this place of, like, backtracking, needing to explain themselves, and in the middle of a fight that could have been completely avoided if they were slow to speak and quick to listen. Right? That's why God gave us two ears and only one mouth. See, words have, I don't know, they just, it just escapes from us before they're carefully considered. Because once it comes out, guys, you can't take it back. Okay? Once it comes out, you can't take it back. And so we're asking, how do we tame the tongue? Two ways, be quick to listen, be slow to speak. And yes, this is James's plea to the early church, but this is my plea for us here at New Community. We're different, maybe we're a little weird, we're a little quirky, but we still come together and we worship together and we extend grace to one another. We remember that each and every one of us here are unique and created in the image of God. And each of us come here, we stand together, united in our hope, in the love, in the grace that we find in Jesus. Because this is what the world needs. This is what the world needs to see. Our testimony to the watching world is a commitment to one another, humbly serving one another, seeing that each person is restored by the power of the gospel and sharing that hope with one another and with others in this world. Because if not, then we are not distinct. If not, we are just like this world, and there's no reason for us to meet. And so even as Jesus is preparing for his death, he prays this last prayer 
And this is my prayer for us. John chapter 17, verse 25. Righteous Father, Jesus prayed. He's, this is his prayer for future believers. Though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Yes, the tongue is powerful. Yes, the tongue is difficult to control. But let's tame our tongues by being men and women that will quickly listen. Be slow to speak. And let's remember that the tongue, it reveals condition of our hearts, what's really going on inside. And remember, when you utter those words, you are now accountable for what you have uttered. Uh, all morning, all I've been thinking about and praying was like the Psalm 19 verse. May the words of my mouth, meditations of my heart, be pleasing to you, God, my rock and my redeemer. That's my prayer for you. Make that your prayer for yourself, that our words would count that our words would build up, encourage, and build God's church. Let's pray together. God, I do pray that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing to you always. For you are our rock. You are our savior. You are our redeemer. And though the world does not know you, we know you. May the world know that you have given us Jesus by the way we speak and we love one another. Help us to be men and women that will quickly listen and be slow to speak. And we invite the Holy Spirit to convict us to take a search inside of our hearts, knowing that we are accountable for what comes out of our mouths. May your power and presence be seen in your church and in this church and in this community. And God, I pray that the world would see us loving one another and would want that same power and that same hope that we have. So we thank you for this encouragement. We thank you for this exhortation from James uh, today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll continue to time of worship as we present our God. Tithes and offerings to the Lord. Give through Zell. If you brought your own physical offering, you drop it in the basket. Let's stand. Let's sing in response to the forgiveness, to the power that we find in Christ, that we would surrender and let our tongues to
pray together. God, thank you for the reminder today that you want the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts to be pleasing to you. That with our tongues, with our words, that we would praise you. And with our words, we would bless your people. Uh, God, remind us that we can't do this on our own, but we need your word. We need your spirit. We need one another to encourage and to push each other on. God, help us, Lord, this week to be faithful to you and to you alone, to be obedient to your word, to, obedient, to, be, to be obedient uh, to the call that you have upon our lives. And so, Lord, may, so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine down upon you. May he give you his favor and peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good afternoon, the community church. Good afternoon. Um, happy first day of summer. Yeah. Yes, it's the first day of summer. And happy Father's Day uh, to you fathers and expectant father, or father, expectant, well, we don't know, but expectant fathers. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so blessed to be able to worship with you today. Uh, so thankful that you guys were able to join us. Um, no new announcements. Um, we have prayer meeting on Tuesday and Thursday. Look forward to seeing you then. Uh, other than that, make sure you call your father or if you're Ethan Shaw, give your father a hug today uh, to say happy Father's Day to them. Other than that, have a blessed week, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you so much.